I'm going to show you some pictures of the problem, some of the problems that we had in our clinic last year. And I don't know if you recognize any of these. We'll be talking about all of them. The stairs, that's pearly blistermite. You can see leaf roller. You've got apple scab. You've got pearly blistermite again, apple maggot. The fruit fly, um, western fruit, fruit fly, and coddling moth and rust. But we'll be covering most of these. So let's go back. Um, what went wrong with your fruit trees last year? Gary, could you put up the poll again, please? So what I want to do today is to give you a common sense approach to your plant problems. And and we're going to be talking mostly, if once we get into chemical um, treatment, about organic because it's better for the environment, it's safer to use, and it's certainly safer for the um, pollinators if they use it correctly. Probably number one is the most important. Get out there and look at your trees. Check them out. Make sure that you know what's going on with them at all times because it's easier to correct a problem you know, when it's small rather than when it gets too big. If you don't know what the uh, insect or plant disease is, make sure that you contact your um, your master gardener clinic. If you're going to do your own ID, make sure that you don't get on YouTube or just do a Google search. Get onto a, um, a .edu site. One of the universities get the information from there. And you're much better getting the information from a Pacific Northwest source because it'll be, you know, what works in Ohio doesn't necessarily work here. And we're going to learn a variety of common sense, non-chemical methods to control problems in the garden. You also have to kind of change your mindset. You have to learn to tolerate harmless pests or ones that really don't do a whole lot of damage. It's better to, you know, gardening's not a perfect thing. We're not gonna be able to control them all. And the more we give them a little bit of time, the more likely we'll be able to get some, um, some beneficial insects. But set a threshold when it's time to act. But not every problem, like I said, needs to be taken care of. And then you keep repeating the whole thing the entire season. Yeah, it's energy intensive. But if you're growing trees in Washington or anywhere, but if you're growing uh, fruit trees in Washington, it's a big responsibility. Because if we have something really terrible over here, it can impact the industry on the west, on the east side. And it's terribly important. And, uh, well, well, we'll go ahead. Let's see. 70% of all plant problems that we see in our plant and insect clinic are non-disease, non-insect problems. Pretty amazing, isn't it? That's the first thing we look for is they're called abiotic. They're not caused by a disease or an insect. Um, every one of these, compacted soil, pavement will do it, Doing putting anything around a tree that stops the rain from getting there mowing or you're using string trim trimmers too close to the trunk, that'll can kill a tree. Herbicide uh, drift is a big one around here. Just because you don't use it doesn't mean your neighbor's not using it. And if they're using it incorrectly, it can get to your plants too, your garden plants and your trees. Heat in the summer, low temps in the winter can be a real problem. Spring frost injury was a real problem last year. A, a lot of people lost their peaches and their uh, cherries, not the plums so much, but the, those two. And like I said, too much water in the winter, like we ended up with if you have poor uh, soil drainage and too little water in the summer. It's, it's really kind of important to water if, you, if we have those kind of really long, dry, no rain summers. Uh, where you plant it, you wanna make sure that it's not in the, sh that you don't have too much shade, that it's not planted too close to something else that's shading it. Uh, too much fertilizer can cause problems as can not enough and Poor pruning, pruning or fruit thinning is a biggie. So I'm not going to cover all of this in detail at all because Art Fuller is going to be talking about a lot of this next time. But I just want to point out that how you plant it, where they are in your yard, it all affects the health of the plant. And a stressed plant is much more vulnerable to uh, insect problems and plant disease. They should have at least eight hours of sun. Your pH should be between six and seven, well-drained soil. And plant them at least, if, you're by, if you have a 12-foot tree, 
plant the trees 12 feet apart. If you have an eight foot tree, eight feet apart. And they need to have at least three feet of soil underneath them so they can plant their feet really well. And this is another one Art will be covering. Try not to, uh, if you plant at the bottom of a slope like this, you're gonna end up within a frost pocket and everybody else's peaches and you know, all their fruit will be fine, but yours always has problems with the pollination because the, the uh, frost damages the buds. Try to avoid uh, south facing slopes because they warm up really early, they flower early, and then it frosts and you have a better chance of losing them. And of course, if you're on a windy slope, you can end up with trouble with that too. Um, get a soil test and we recommend simply soil testing because they're local and they will tell you exactly what you need. It's not always necessary to uh, produce or to fertilize tree fruit plants because they they don't, they take a lot, but they, as long as they're growing well, as long as you've got about a foot of new growth and has healthy foliage, you may not need any fertilizer. And if you have vigorous growth from over fertilizing, it attracts uh, aphids for one thing, but other things too, that vigorous uh, fresh green growth. So when do you fertilize? If you need to fertilize, after the trees finished blooming, uh, don't fertilize after mid-June. And you can add five to 10 composts, uh, uh, pounds of compost un under the drip line or a light application of ammonium sulfate around the drip line after the first year. Bone meal if indicated by a, a soil test. Other nutrients can be added in the fall. And one of the ones that we have a problem with here on this side is boron. Uh, we have, don't, the tree uses a lot of boron. And what you can do with that is, let's see if I've got the, I think I've got the, I think it's like four tablespoons. No, here it is. A tablespoon to two gallons of water. That's the proper of borax, you know, the laundry thing. Add two tablespoons of borax to two, uh, a tablespoon of borax to two gallons or more of water and apply it to the soil within the drip line in the fall. If you, more is not better. If you put too much, it'll, probably kill the tree because it can be used as a uh, herbicide too. You don't want that to happen. Variety selection, I am not gonna talk about this. Art's going to be talking about it. I will stress that mini dwarf rootstock or pruning a semi-dwarf to no taller than you can reach with your hands is the way to go because organic management or any kind of management of any kind of tree problem depends on you being able to reach it. Um, ladders are dangerous, but the other thing too is you should not be doing anything, you know, treating with a pesticide, any tree that's over 10 feet tall. If you have a tree that's over 10 feet tall, please call somebody, a licensed pesticide applicator to take care of it. Bare roots, the way to go. They grow faster, they're cheaper, and I, I can't believe how fast they grow, but there's, whoops, I, I lost one. No, I didn't. Okay, the trees that you choose have to be uh, blooming at the same time if they're gonna pollinate because they need cross-pollination from a different kind of tree. There are a lot of charts out there and on the website I showed you, you'll be able to go there. The links are there so that you can go and um, check the, the pollination charts so that you buy two of the right kind of tree that'll be blooming at the right time. So the most apples and pears and many sweet cherries and plums do need a different variety in order for, for cross pollination to occur and the bloom times have to overlap. Most peaches, nectarines, apricots, sour cherries, and some of the sweet cherries are self fertile. So you don't need more than one, but most of the time, they actually do better if you have another variety there. Um, so know what you're getting and read about it and ask for help if you need it. These guys, the little mason bees, they're the early pollinators that are out before the other bees are. And we want to make sure that they're around. If you're not raising bees, come to the talk uh, uh, if you're on this side um, of the 
mountains. On March 4th, Billy is going to be, Billy Bever is one of our master gardeners. She raises mason bees. We'll be talking about it. If not, uh, try to get information about it so that you'll know to, how to encourage them around your property and your neighborhood. Small trees are the way to go. This is my backyard tree. Actually, it's two trees planted in the same hole. I've got um, Bardsey and Liberty. The Liberty is amazing. And I don't get any insect pests other than, <laughs> other than the uh, leaf roller caterpillar. And the reason I have that is I didn't put it on until too late. So this is the way to go. This is one way of handling it. I could also, because the tree's small enough, I could put on little um, bags or uh, hoodies to keep the insects away from my fruit. And I, this is, I'm not going to go into this, Art's going to talk about it, but if this is what you can get, if you get some of the, this, the dwarf root stalks, you get short trees, you know five, six feet, eight to 10 feet, they will need to be staked, but you'll be able to handle them. If you get into the uh, M26, which are the semi-dwarfs, they get very tall and good pruning techniques will keep them small, but it's a, it's a never ending fight. You're better off with the um, dwarf root stalks. And same thing with cherries, you get the dwarfs. Same thing with pears. There are dwarf varieties there. Anything that you can keep them small so that you can handle uh, any problems that arise. Okay, bare root trees. I'm not gonna cover this. I know Art's going to next year. Okay, so why do root trees fail to bear? I, that's a big question we get. The dwarf varieties bear fruit sooner, usually within two, two years, sometimes three years and they grow faster. So that's another reason to get a small dwarf tree. Environmental stress, some of the things we were talking about uh, at the beginning, they can stress the tree and make them much more vulnerable to problems. So here's the bearing age, apples two to five. So some people come in, they planted their tree last year and wanna know why it didn't have fruit that following year. Well, it just wasn't grown up enough yet. Fruiting habits, I now have a, biennial fruit bearing apple tree because I did not thin the fruit and now I get a heavy load one year and I get hardly anything this year or the, the following year. This year it's going to be low because I did not thin it enough. It breaks my heart to thin and you got to do it. Cultural practices, we talked about that. It's got to be planted in the right place. And the trouble with growing peaches and sweet cherries over on our side is that side of the um, cascades is that they're very sensitive to cold and almost always they will like, something will happen and it will damage the the blossoms and when that happens you don't get fruit you don't get flowers you don't get fruit and here are some examples of non-pest non-disease problems this is no big deal the burnouts it's uh just a something weird to look at. You start getting some adventitious root growth. Um, June drop, don't be shocked when you see a lot of fruit falling to the ground in June. That's a tree's way of trying to conserve its energy so that you can have fruit. And broken, the, if you don't prune, it can lead to broken branches and you can fix some of them, but why not prevent it in the first place? So what are some of the causes of June drop? Basically, it's the tree trying to conserve energy. So what we want to do is you thin the tree and thin the fruit on the tree so that the tree can put its energy into a smaller number of apples, pears, you know, any peaches and plums um, before they drop. The earlier you get them, usually they tell you to start thinning the fruit when the fruit is thumb size. So the uh, blossoms fall falling off and the little apple is starting to form. When it gets about the size of the tip of your thumb, start um, thinning them. 
you don't want any in clusters like that. Thin it to one per cluster. This is what I didn't do. The other thing this will do, if you have apples touching each other, it's a great place for calling moths to live. So if they're touching each other, not a good thing. Um, it also, uh, there's less chance of tree injury because it, you know, lessens the load on the branches. And it helps to even out the production from year to year because like last year, my poor tree, it used up an awful lot of resources. So it needs a year off. But if I had been... Um, thinning the fruit, I think it probably would have given me fruit every year. But once that's established, the biennial bearing, it's really hard to change. My cat is walking across. Um, you can read, I think Art's going to be talking about that, but look up fruit thinning. It's very important. And there you can see the tiny little ones, pick the best ones to stay. Those are small. Here's the biggest in the bunch. Keep it. Okay, here's some other ones. Sun scald, we saw a lot of that last year. There's a limited number of things you can do. It's usually on the west side. You can cover the tree. Again, if it's small, you can cover the tree. This was uh, tree was probably planted facing south, and this hot sun hit it in the wintertime, and then the temperatures went down in the, in the evening, and the tree wasn't ready for it, and it split. It doesn't necessarily kill a tree. The tree can usually heal itself, but not always. You're better off preventing it. You can shade it or you can paint it with half um, its interior acrylic paint, half water, half paint, and um, you can whitewash the trunk. That helps to reflect the heat instead of absorb it. Frost. You can see what happens when the frost hits it, but you only need 10% of undamaged flowers to produce a, a good crop. So it may not be as devastating as it looks. Cover your tree, if it's small, cover your tree if you expect very cold temperatures. Animal damage, the picture on the right was taken from a master gardener's uh, a volunteer tree patch. And he said that those were, he thought those were voles eating that. You can cover the trunks. The disease triangle, this is now we're getting into the uh, guts of things. If you remove one of the problems, like if you've got a, a tree that's not getting enough shade and transplant it to where it's getting sun, you have removed this one, the conducive environment, and you, you may not get as much disease. Unfortunately, a lot of the fungal diseases we have over here, it's because we have cold, wet conditions and there's not a lot we can do about that. You have to have a susceptible host. So you've got the tree and you if you plant um, trees that are like scab resistant, you've probably given yourself a better chance. And the pathogens, the, the diseases in the insects, are usually around and they will get you if, if, they're, uh, if they're out floating around. What can you do? Essential, pick up fallen fruit and leaves. That uh, helps to reduce the places where the fungus grows and it uh, moves away the chances for the, I've got to put my cat down, um, the chances for a place for the uh, insects to hide. Make sure you water your tree. We talked about all that. Prune to allow good circulation. Uh, Art's going to be talking about that. That's a health thing. That's not a um, necessarily a cosmetic thing. You need to allow good circulation, especially for uh, fruit trees like peaches. And avoid the use of broad spectrum pesticides. I'm going to be talking about the ones that probably would be the best ones to use. They are the least toxic. Like I said earlier, having a home orchard is a huge responsibility because if you don't take care of your problems, you can impact the commercial fruit and nut production. And we do have a backyard fruit tree schedule that <clears throat> was developed and it tells you exactly when to use it. And it tells you how to use it and gives you some, uh, uh, some tips about it. This is also, you'll have this available, you'll be able to get this. And it's very useful. And this is on the website. This gives you a year long calendar that shows you what needs to be done when. 
these are the, the um, organic pesticides that are probably the least toxic and the ones that you might want to use if you're going to use any. But they only work if you're doing that monitoring and identifying the problem and, um, you know, using the barrier methods like I just showed. If you're doing everything right and it's still more than you can handle, then the last resort is to use your um the fungicides or, or insecticides. It's really, really important to follow the label directions, not just for you, but for the environment. I've got a list of things here. I, I could tell you about each one of these, but we can't go into it that much. Neem and spinosad should be applied at night. Um, they can be very toxic to um, bees and other pollinators. And if you apply it at dusk, it lets it dry overnight. And by um, morning time, it won't bother them. Uh, they work on contact, which means that neem will not work as a preventive for pests. You've got to see the pest and you've got to spray it. Same thing with spinosad. If, well, no, so I'm sorry. Spinosad, you can spray on the leaves and if they eat it, then they'll get sick. But the pyrethrins and insecticidal soaps, they've got to be um, on the, the uh, critter or it won't do anything. You can't go spraying your anything with uh, insecticidal soaps and expect it to deter insects. It won't work. BT is another one like spinosad that the uh, insects will eat and that'll it'll give them an upset tummy and they'll quit eating. The copper and sulfur-based um, fungicides, you should never apply anything to a plant that's in flower, even though some of the older publications, including, including the one that I'm going to give you, it's an excellent publication, but they're saying for some of the diseases to plant, uh, to spray during flower, they're finding out more and more that all of the um, fungicides, even the, the organic ones, can affect bees. I, I really don't recommend it. So here are the common, most common problems we have. This was from my apple tree. The birds, that was the first year. It never occurred to me the blue jays would eat them like that. They take one bite, two bites, and then they go and ruin another apple. Coddling moth. This is also from a friend of mine's tree. It's a very small half inch um, moth, which you probably will never see. But what you'll see is an apple like this. And when you cut it open, you may or may not see the actual, the, the um, usual suspect, but you will see the tunnel where they were eating and that part of the fruit is destroyed. You can use this, you can cut out the bad part and use this apple, unlike um, apple maggot where you, you, they're useless. So what happens with these? This is so important to control it, but you don't want to start too early or too late. Just before the, um, the tree blooms, that's when the first generation of the coddling moths comes out. And they have been probably in a cocoon on the tree's trunk all the way over winter. And then they pupated and then they come out as adults. The adults mate and they come and they lay um, eggs on the fruit and the eggs hatch and the larvae, the little caterpillars go into your fruit. Whoops. And they, there's a two to three generations a year, which means that it's a full year problem. What can you do? We're gonna go mechanical first. You can use corrugated cardboard and you can wrap it around the trunk of the tree. And hopefully that will encourage the cocoons, the, the, um, the ones that are wanting to pupate, that they'll make their cocoons and pupate in the um, shelter inside the the corrugated cardboard. So you leave it there and you make sure that you get it out and take it out in late June, or you're just providing a good place for the coddling moths to live. What you want to do is trap them before they, they come out. The second generation, you want to install a new strip in mid-July. This is not going to stop the problem, but it might help if you just have a, a few. You may have to go more than that. If you had the problem last year and didn't take care of it, you're going to have it this year too. So get started in, in May. 
You can bag the fruit 10 days after petal fall when most of the petals have fallen off. And after the fruits have been thinned, like we said, when they're about the size of your thumb and bag them then. And as they grow, they'll be protected. There's different ways, different things you can do. You can use any of these. You can also use kale and spray, which kind of puts a, you know, kind of like a flocking on the tree and it makes them less desirable for the insects to lay eggs, including the apple maggot. These also work for apple maggot. Actually, the, the treatment for apple maggot and codling moth are the same. It's just that the uh, codling moth comes out earlier than the, the uh, apple maggot but the treatment's the same. If you're treating for coddling moth and continue the treatment, then um, you're also gonna take care of the apple maggot. Make sure that you pick up any infested fruit, pick it off the tree, get it off the ground, because especially with the apple maggot, they'll go in the ground and pupate and they'll be right underneath your tree. And when they come out, they, they've, got your, they've got your tree, they got your apples. It, it's you know instant dinner. So make sure you get any infested fruit off the ground and off the tree. So you spray twice for each generation. They, you could also put up a trap to find out if the males are there. But if you had them last year, like I said, you're probably going to have them this year. And you can, if this is less precise, but it works and it's not as hard, apply a spinosad product. You have to look at the container and see if it has spinosad in it. That's the active ingredient. Apply it 10 days after full petal fall and do that twice in June. 14, 10 days to 14 days apart, once in July and once in August. And that will give reasonably good control. It will also help to control apple maggot, which is, yeah, really good. And here we are with apple maggot. It's a fly. You hardly ever see them because they're stealth artists. You'll see dimpling on the fruit like that. And when you cut the apple open, you'll see a roadmap of a mess. This is uh, bacterial deterioration inside the uh, apple where the maggots have been feeding. They're very small, you may or may not see them. The adults lay the eggs on the fruit and the, the, they can lay a hundred eggs. So what happens when the apples drop to the ground, the larvae go into the soil and pupate there. Like I said, and next year they come right up and they've got your tree. They don't even have to fly and look for a, a host. We are not on the west side, we are not permitted by law to take homegrown apples over to the other side. When I first moved here, I don't think there was anything, but they didn't have apple maggot at all on the other side of the, the uh, Cascades, but they do now. It could devastate, devastate the commercial crop. So it, we've got to take care of this problem. You can use uh, sticky traps to see if you've got them. These are just red balls, or you can just hang apples up and, and put um, Vaseline on them or Tanglefoot. And if you catch any flies, then you know you've got that and you want to uh, take care of it. Um, so again, you can cover the fruit after the June drop and th fruit thinning, or you can cover the entire tree with netting like I did. The pesticides you can use are uh, Spinosad. Again, that's organic. Most, most um, formulations are organic. 17 to 21 days after petal fall. And you'll see that this kind of coincides with the coddling moth. And so you should be controlling for both. Didn't mean to do that. So you'll apply that in early July and every 10 to seven to uh, 14 days until just before you pick them. Something you have to know about the organic pesticides, they take longer to work. They don't last as long, but they're worth it because they, you know, if you're using it in conjunction with all the other methods we, we talked about, then it will help to protect the environment and it will do a decent job. This isn't, okay, powdery mildew isn't a problem we have very often here on the, the west side because it has to kind of be warm and we don't usually have warm until it's, uh, you know, summer and then the sun comes out and we never have any more rain. So 
but but you can have that more, I guess, on the west side or on the east side. Choose resistant varieties. It will say on the tag, avoid excess nitrogen because they really like to have that fresh green fruit and that uh, or fresh green leaves and the nitrogen really makes a uh, vigorous growth. So when the leaves are just separating from the bud, that would be the time to use a, uh, a fungicide. Neem oil, you can apply it at night, potassium bicarbonate, horticultural oil um, and sulfur. Those are the organic methods. Myco microbutanol is not organic, but that should be applied at night also if you're gonna use that. Apple scab, I've got that on one of my trees. And last year, my husband lost all the leaves on the trees he planted because of apple scab. And I've got to go out there and uh, take care of it this year. They, uh, you can end up with the blotches on the, the uh, fruit. But before that, you'll see it on the leaves. And you might not know what it is. And if you see leaves that look like this, and then as the um, lesion ages, it turns crispy brown. And the fungus overwinters on the dead apple leaves or fruit on the ground. So again, sanitation is really important. Clean it up. Another way, if you have a lot of trees, if you um, take the lawnmower over them and run them over with it and shred them, that seems to stop most of the uh, spores from, from contaminating the trees, which I don't understand, but um, University of Minnesota has done studies on it and they say it works. So this is when you would treat it, when it's uh, at the green tip stage. It's, it's just starting to come out. And if you find that you've got these scabs um, on the leaves or on the fruit, you can't treat it. It it's, doesn't help. But you'll know to do it next fall and next spring. It, doesn't, it won't take care of the problem that year. Bitter pit is kind of like blossom and rot on tomatoes, except it's for apples. It's low levels of calcium in the fruit. And most of the time it's caused by dry, hot weather and not keeping your soil evenly moist. The, if you let it get completely dry and then you wet it up, it, it's really hard for the plant to make sure that it gets what it needs when it needs it. And you can also get this if you have low boron in the soil. And if you remember, I said, if you, if you have low boron in the soil, soil test will help. Uh, dissolve one tablespoon of borax and two gallons of water, but you apply that in the fall. Honeycrisp is especially susceptible to that. And it kind of looks like apple maggot from the outside, but when you cut it open, you don't have that roadmap of um, maggot trails. Brown marmorated stink bug, not a whole lot you can do about that. They're everywhere. Um, they uh, usually only stick their little beak in and suck stuff out, maybe you know a couple set, a couple millimeters, so you can just peel that away. But it's they're impervious to most insecticides because of that shield that they've got. What you can do though is learn to recognize what they look like. Anytime you see anything that looks like these, those are the immature stages. Get them, get them while they're little before they get big. I had a problem with this last year. It's almost not worth treating. I, I end up with about 30 leaves that have them on it and it doesn't really hurt the tree. I've decided that I can live with that. If I'm outside in the garden and I see anything rolled, any of the leaves rolled up, I'll squish it. I don't like to use the pesticides because when I do that, I'm, I'm also have the possibility of killing beneficial insects. And I really don't wanna do that. But you can use BT, although it hasn't been uh, shown to be very effective. Neem will work, um, dormant spray oil or spinosad. But the BT can only be used if the caterpillars are actively feeding and if you can get it in the rolled up leaf. Apple anthracnose is everywhere on the east side or on the west side. I don't know if it's on the uh, east side or not. Our um, master gardener, Orchard in the demonstration garden are the trees have it. They say if you have more than six, four to six branches that are affected by it, you can see the canker here and you can see kind of fiddle string like growth 
of the remaining trunk, uh, the remaining bark, um, they say you should cut the tree down. Although some people say, well, it's not going to hurt anything, but you're still spreading the spores to other people's trees who may not have it. This is what it looks like when it first starts out. It's just kind of a bruise, but it can also get on the fruit, kind of a bullseye look to the fruit. The infection starts in the fall, but you don't see it until the spring. And it proliferates there and then spreads to the rest of the trees and everybody else's trees. There's not a lot you can do about it unless you want to go in there and cut it out. You would cut a canoe shaped um, area around the canker and you'd sterilize it with, with a torch. Copper-based fungicides, you can spray it at uh, petal fall in two weeks pre-harvest to control it and before the rains start again, but it, it won't work unless you remove the cankers. If you've got a severe infestation of this, you're better off cutting the tree down, planting a dwarf tree and starting over again, start over again. Um, I didn't see much of this last year. The problem with rust, th these are two different kinds. This appears early, this appears late, is that they have an alternate host. And if you can't get rid of that alternate host, juniper and incense cedar, then it's going to keep coming back. There's no treatment that works. And the problem is that whatever the other tree is, the incense cedar or the juniper, it um, might not be on your property. I think it's like a hundred feet or something, hundred yards, I can't remember, but it might be down the road, you'd never know it was there. But once it shows up, you know that it's there and the only treatment, true treatment is to um, get rid of the other one or don't plant, or learn to live with the rust or don't plant uh, pear trees. Pear leaf blister mite. We have this all over our pear tree and I've got to get out and treat it very soon here. Um, th they go under the leaves and they cause these little blisters on the back of them. And you can recognize it because they're usually right along that mid vein. And it's usually like this at first, like this at first and then this second. And then later in the season, they, they turn brown. And like he lost almost all the leaves on that tree because it was so bad. And it, the leaves came back, but it still weakened the tree. That tree is stressed. The, um, the, they infest the bud scales in, in August and September. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go out with uh, horticultural oil once the uh, buds start to swell. And I'm going to spray it. And hopefully that'll suffocate the, uh, the mites. And they say to remove the affected leaves. Well, I could do that unless you take everything off and... You know, your tree doesn't have any leaves. It's not making nutrients. And so that's not really an option if you've got a, a big infestation. Usually you see it starting on one branch. And if you if it's not an important branch, you might want to prune that off. Stone fruits. I've got just a few more minutes here. Um, these are some of the problems that you see. The biggest problems we've seen over here is peach leaf curl, brown rot. And those are actually, and sometimes spotted wing drosophila, those are the big ones over here. Perineum blight, not so much. It, it, it doesn't really cause a big problem except for spots and holes in the leaves. It's not a good idea to grow any of those except for the uh, European plums on the west side. There's just too many things that can go wrong, that, uh, especially sweet cherries. They're really not good over here. Um, but the tart cherries, they bloom later, so they're less susceptible to, uh, to frost damage, and there's more pollinators out. Now, this, uh, there's less fruit cracking, but they can get bacterial uh, canker and gamosa, with gamosis, which is that, that gummy stuff all over the bark that you see. And, but there are some disease-resistant varieties that you may want to look into if you really insist on um, growing tart cherries. And again, if you get something uh, uh, dwarf, then you'll be a little bit better, easy, or easier to take care of it. It'll be easier to take care of it. The Japanese plums, these pretty ones, they 
they bloom really early and they are very susceptible to frost. People have a real hard time with them. These European plums, they do really well here. In fact, sometimes they do too well. And if people don't prune them, I can't tell you how many prune, uh, prune trees I've seen where the um, branches have fallen on the ground and split off the tree because they didn't, you know, thin them. But most of them, most of the Europeans or most of them require cross pollination. Peaches and nectarines, um, we were told by when we were in training, don't grow them on the, on the uh, west side. There's just too many problems. Um, even with the, the ones that are made here to grow, you know, that are, they say that it's peach curl resistant, leaf curl resistant, they don't do well. But you can cover smaller trees with a plastic bag from December to late February to shield it from the, the, uh, the fungal, the fungus getting it. The other thing you can do, the best thing you can do is grow it in a pot and bring it under shade under, so it's not get the leaves aren't getting wet in the winter time. I, I have I'm I don't have, but my son has a, a peach tree that he um, wheels out in the summer and he wheels it back underneath their deck, which is you know is um, completely yes. out of the, the rain and it's doing very well. Aphids, we saw a ton of aphids last year and um, they don't really damage the fruit too much, but it can damage enough leaves that you can uh, lose a lot of leaves, which affects the tree health. That it also, the honeydew that they produce pr will allow black mold to grow on the leaves, which is ugly, doesn't really cause too much harm. But if you let it, if you try to keep them under control by very, very uh, light methods like hosing them off and maybe spraying a little bit. I, I didn't last year. And I had all kinds of beneficial insects come and take care of my head ladybugs. And I had little tiny, um, little tiny wasps that parasitoid wasps that actually stuck um, their stinger in and, and laid eggs in them and it killed the uh, aphids that way. So what you do, if you had aphids last year, they probably overwintered in the crevices in, in the tree trunk. In late March, apply horticultural oil to the bark and buds, and it will suffocate the, um, the early aphids. That'll help to keep the population down. If you do um, end up with a problem and can't live with it, make sure that you use uh, either insecticidal soaps or neem, but they have to be sprayed on the aphids to work. You can't spray it as a preventive. Peach leaf curl, horrible. Everybody had it. Last year, my son's, oh, the tree that he had growing in his backyard lost every single leaf. I told him I wanted a picture of it so I could take it in and show the people in the clinic. And he says, oh, it's out back. And I went back to take pictures of it. There were no leaves on the tree. It was really bad. And I, a lot of people had that trouble. It's a fungal disease that affects the leaves and the twigs, and it overwinters in the trees and, and the twigs and the bud. There are resistant varieties, but I haven't seen that that works too well. What you can do uh, is remove and destroy the infected leaves like we've talked to before. You can start in late fall when half the leaves have dropped, you can um, apply the first fungicide, copper ammonia-based fungicide like uh, Monterey Liquid Cop, and starting in January, you can start now if you had it this year or had it last year, start now and then spray every three weeks until just before the leaves open. That should take care of most of the problem and you'll have to let me know if it did. So um, apply, go out and get one of these um, Monterey Liquid Cop, something like that with a copper ammonia fungicide, look at the ingredients and go out and spray it and then keep spraying it every three weeks until the leaves open and let me know if that worked for you. This is a bad one and I am gonna have to be almost done here. Um, brown rot and canker, bacterial canker look pretty much the same except that if you see fungal spores, then um, you've got brown rot. Um, what you can do with this, if you had it last year, you, um, you can apply copper fungicide before bloom. After blooming, you can use sulfur. Um, you can also prune out infected shoots if it's not too extensive. 
but I really don't recommend applying any of the fungicides to the blossoms. You're going to poison the bees. Bacterial canker looks almost identical to it, but it, you won't see any of the um, fungal spores. I prune out, I prune in summer. You don't prune now. And Art will be talking about that. And uh, if you have a tree that's infected by that, you're probably better off just getting rid of it. Copper-based fungicides might work, but not very well. It's, it's a bad disease, and if your tree has it, you should probably get rid of it. Crinium blight shot hole is another one that all the stone fruits get. It's not a real bad disease. It, it causes these tannish um, blemishes on the leaves, and then they fall out as they mature, and you've got holes in them. But um, it, one of the things they tell you to do is avoid overhead watering. Nah, not here. That's not going to work. Again, sanitation and pruning out the bad stuff. You can use uh, copper and sulfur. My, myco, mycobutanil and chlorothalonil are bad news for the bees. You can apply at petal fall, at shuck fall, and two weeks later. And you should rotate the fungicide products so they don't become resistant. Spotted wing drosophila, you see those in your berries and you see them in your um, strawberries and you see them in cherries. They're a kind of vinegar fly and you can trap them to see if you have them, but that is not gonna take care of the problem. What you can do is pick fruit very frequently and don't let it get ripe and don't let it um, sit on the ground. And that goes for all the berries too. Pick them frequently and get anything on the ground off. Um, you can only use pesticides. They only work on the adults. If you see the adults, it's not going to, if you spray the fruit, it's not going to do anything to the maggots. And the fruit must be listed on the label. So read the label. And if it says, you know, strawberries, if it says apple trees, then you can use it. Okay. I don't know if anybody has seen scale. I didn't see any um, answers about that. This is really tricky because they have a shield on them. The only time you can take care of the problem is when the babies are crawling away from their mother and they're mobile because these guys stick on the tree trunks and don't move once they're there. You gotta get them when they're small. So try April and you can use Tanglefoot, which is like a tree glue, and it'll, it'll help to catch the uh, crawlers or you can apply oil to the overwintering stage just before the buds swell in the spring. I haven't had good luck with that. Once they're there, I mean, you've got to be out there every day. So walnut, huskfly, this is my last one. Um, it's a serious mid to late season uh, pest of the walnuts in the West. It can also attack peaches, but I've not heard any problems with that. It's the size of a housefly and that's what it looks like. It infests the meat, so it's it just totally ruins it. What do you do? So you remove the fallen infested fruit and remove the, so you're removing the source of the infestation, probably another walnut tree, an infected walnut tree. Hang sticky traps out in early July because this is a like a late July, mid-August big problem. If you see any of these sticky traps that you can get on Amazon um, and you catch any of the flies, you know you've got it. So as soon as you see it, uh, uh, catch a fly, you want to begin your spray um, regimen. So late July to mid-August, that's when you really need to take care of it. You'd use neem oil or a spinosad, and both of those you would want to apply at dusk. You, you would apply it again in 10 days if the husk fly was a problem the previous years, and a third application might be needed three to four weeks later if you're still catching flies. It's something that you have to be on top of all the time. And at the end here, these are just for reference. Again, you'll be able to access this on our website. They talk about the different times when you should spray and you're know, like bud burst and tight cluster first pink. Here's what they look like. Same thing for cherries, peaches, nectarines. If you're going to look at any publication, look at this one. It is excellent. And I'm gonna put that in the chat. You might want to click on it and just open it up and um, go to it later. 
And I think I am finished. Um, are there any questions? I am going to stop sharing. <laughs>